Welcome to America and the Vietnam War, an interactive U.S. history tutorial for students like you. Let's begin by reviewing the time period of the Vietnam War, which took place during the Cold War era. After the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union were the two most powerful nations left standing. But the former allies now became enemies. America and the Soviet Union differed on issues of human rights, individual liberties, economic philosophies, and religious freedom. The U.S. was a capitalist democracy, a nation of free ideas and free trade. But the Soviet Union was a communist nation. Communism is an economic idea that all people should be equal and have the same, by any means necessary. In reality, communist nations like the Soviet Union took the form of dictatorships. Citizens were poor, were the victims of government propaganda, lacked basic rights like freedom of speech, and could not freely elect their leaders. The Soviet Union wanted to spread a communist revolution across the entire world. The U.S. was determined to oppose this. For almost 50 years, a Cold War existed between the United States and other democracies and the Soviet Union and other communist nations, which soon included China, the most populous nation on Earth. Both sides possessed nuclear weapons and were prepared to use them, so an actual war between them wasn't an option. It might have resulted in the end of human civilization. So the U.S. and the Soviet Union never actually went to war, directly at least. What they did do was to square off in a series of smaller proxy wars involving other nations. A proxy is someone else who acts on your behalf. These conflicts allowed the two enemies to oppose each other while never using nuclear weapons. The Vietnam War is a Cold War era proxy war. Vietnam is a long, narrow country located in Southeast Asia in a region called Indochina. It is bordered by China, Laos, and Cambodia. Vietnam has a complex history that includes numerous struggles for independence. It was part of Imperial China for over a millennium, was a colony of the French before World War II, and was occupied by the Japanese during World War II. After World War II, the French wanted Vietnam back, and the First Indochina War began. Ho Chi Minh, a communist revolutionary, led the Viet Minh and its People's Army of Vietnam against the French. Above all else, Ho Chi Minh wanted an independent, united, communist Vietnam. The Viet Minh were provided financial support and military supplies by China and the Soviet Union, also communist powers. The U.S. supported the French in order to slow the spread of communism in this region. U.S. President Harry Truman and his successor, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, were both determined to limit America's military involvement in the war, choosing instead to provide financial support to the French through an approach called dollar diplomacy. Eisenhower stated, no one could be more bitterly opposed to ever getting the U.S. involved in a hot war in that region than I am. By the end of 1953, the United States was paying nearly 80% of the cost of the French military effort. The war would drag on for eight years. In 1954, just weeks after a decisive French defeat at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the war would come to an end with the French negotiating a complete withdrawal. By the end of the war, some statistics estimate the Vietnamese suffered more than three times the number of casualties as the French, and yet the Viet Minh emerged as the victors. Bringing closure to the First Indochina War, the Geneva Accords were issued in July 1954 at the Geneva Conference. The terms called for a ceasefire along the 17th parallel, with a three-mile demilitarized zone on either side, essentially dividing Vietnam into two Vietnams, north and south. The Viet Minh forces were given 300 days to withdraw to the north and French forces to the south, while the Viet Minh were also to remove troops from neighboring Laos and Cambodia. Emphasized in the Accords, the division of Vietnam was only supposed to be temporary. French forces were slated to leave by 1956, and nationwide elections for Vietnam were scheduled to be held in 1956 to reunify Vietnam under one government. The agreement was signed by the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, France, the People's Republic of China, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom. The agreement was reached over the objections of South Vietnam, which refused to sign. Additionally, the U.S. did not sign the agreements, arguing that the Geneva Accords granted too much power to the Communist Party of Vietnam.
once the geneva accords were issued the united states was concerned that if nationwide elections were held a unified communist vietnam would result when the government of south vietnam refused to work with the north to hold nationwide elections in 1956 because of this fear the u s supported them but why did the u s get involved the u s government was committed to containing communism and did not want to see it spread the government believed in the domino theory and this meant that if nations were like dominoes and one asian country fell to communist rule then neighboring nations would also fall to communism the u s took on the role of helping to prepare south vietnam to defend itself from a potential communist takeover by the north and to help support and strengthen the new south vietnamese non-communist government determining the exact start date of the vietnam war also called the second indochina war is challenging but november nineteen fifty five is most commonly cited as the beginning of the war the war would last until april thirtieth nineteen seventy five america's heaviest involvement would occur from nineteen sixty five to nineteen seventy three the war would take place in vietnam laos and cambodia the vietnam war was a civil war fought for control of vietnam in which the u s became increasingly involved but as we stated earlier it was also a cold war era proxy war between the united states and the soviet union one side was communist north vietnam which included the viet minh and its people's army of vietnam commonly called the north vietnamese army or nva during this war the nva was supported by its allies in the south called the viet cong who are best known for their skilled use of guerrilla warfare and attacking south vietnam from within the soviet union china and other communist allies also supported the north on the other side was the government of south vietnam and its army of the republic of vietnam known as arvn or arvn the united states as its major supporter and other non-communist allies with nationwide elections no longer a means for ho chi minh to reunify vietnam the communists planned to use force of arms against south vietnam instead in nineteen fifty five the u s began training the south vietnamese army to resist the north in nineteen fifty nine the north vietnamese army and the viet cong began large-scale fighting in the south and in this same year u s advisers were assigned to south vietnamese army regiments president eisenhower was opposed to the use of u s combat troops believing that military intervention would bog down into a costly stalemate instead he continued the practice of dollar diplomacy by providing financial support to south vietnam as did his successor president john f kennedy in 1961, during Kennedy's administration, he also began sending members of the U.S. Special Forces as military advisors to South Vietnam. Kennedy did not want to lose another country to communism, but he also stated, in the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. We can help them as advisors, but they have to win it. In October 1963, Kennedy announced his administration's intention to withdraw U.S. forces from South Vietnam by the end of 1965, but one month later, Kennedy was assassinated. His vice president, Lyndon Johnson, assumed the presidency, and the direction of the war now fell upon his administration's shoulders. By the end of 1963, America's military forces serving in Vietnam as advisors totaled over 16,000 after lyndon johnson took office the direction of america's involvement in vietnam had to be decided johnson came to believe america's role in vietnam had to be increased he wanted to maintain the u s commitment to its ally south vietnam to contain communism and protect southeast asia from the domino effect and he also did not want to be the first u s president to lose a war in 1964, the U.S. was supporting ongoing South Vietnamese raids in the countryside and implementing a U.S. program of bombing the Laotian border to disrupt supply lines flowing down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was a series of trails thousands of miles long leading from North Vietnam through Cambodia and Laos to South Vietnam. It was used to bring weapons, supplies, and manpower to support the Viet Cong in its war in the South. The U.S. military also began backing South Vietnamese raids on North Vietnam's coasts. At the beginning of August 1964, while monitoring these raids, the USS Maddox was patrolling in the Gulf of Tonkin. The Maddox reported being fired upon by North Vietnamese torpedo boats. It was also reported that a sea battle ensued and that several North Vietnamese torpedo boats were damaged, but the Maddox experienced no casualties. 
Two days later, dealing with rough seas and bad weather, the Maddox and the USS C. Turner Joy believed they spotted enemy boats and were under attack, but there was confusion surrounding these reports and whether enemy vessels were even present. However, Johnson went on television and told a national audience that the North Vietnamese had initiated unprovoked attacks on two U.S. destroyers in the Gulf of Tonkin. He used these events to escalate U.S. involvement in the war. Just days later, Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. This gave the president power to escalate the war without an official declaration of war. In fact, during this lengthy war, Congress never officially declared war against Vietnam, and as a result, the Vietnam War is considered an unofficial war. Declassified documents later revealed that in the first incident with the USS Maddox, the U.S. fired first, not the North Vietnamese, and that no attack actually occurred two days later. Johnson had used these events as political cover to escalate the war. Thus began Johnson's problems with a credibility gap. In other words, a gap between what presidents said about the war and the reality. In March 1965, Johnson initiated a strategic bombing campaign against North Vietnam called Operation Rolling Thunder. It would last until November 1968. It was the first sustained assault on North Vietnam and represented a major expansion of America's involvement in the war. Also in March, the first U.S. combat troops arrived in Vietnam. By the summer, American forces were engaged in search-and-destroy operations across the South. During this phase of the war, Johnson stated, We will not be defeated. We will not grow tired. We will not withdraw. Johnson continued to increase troop levels in Vietnam, and by the end of 1967, U.S. forces would number over 400,000. Over 9,000 soldiers were killed in this year. However, William Westmoreland, in charge of the U.S. military forces in Vietnam from 1964 to 1968, reported in November 1967 that the end of the war was beginning to come into view. Despite the Johnson's administration's upbeat claims that the war in Vietnam was going well for America and that the enemy was weakened and exhausted, the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong launched a series of coordinated attacks across the South on January 31, 1968. This was the first day of the Vietnamese New Year, called Tet, and the Tet Offensive defied a holiday truce when 80,000 communist troops launched attacks on 100 towns and cities across the South. It was the largest military operation of either side up to that point in the war. The Tet Offensive was launched in a series of phases that continued throughout the summer of 1968. Militarily, most agree it was a victory for the South, as U.S. and South Vietnamese forces were able to regain all of the lost territory. However, the degree of coordination and the intensity of this large-scale surprise attack shocked the American public and contradicted claims by the U.S. government that enemy forces were unable to mount a major offensive and that the end of the war was in sight. The Tet Offensive called into question Johnson's problems with a credibility gap again, and the offensive also played a key role in causing the anti-war movement to grow. The Vietnam War is often referred to as the first television war, or the living room war. Throughout the war, Americans were able to gather in front of their televisions during the nightly news and receive images and reports of U.S. forces fighting in Vietnam. After the Tet Offensive, popular CBS journalist Walter Cronkite went to Vietnam to see what was happening for himself. He then reported his belief that the Vietnam War would end in a stalemate. Upon hearing this news, Johnson stated that, If I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America. Just over one month later, Johnson called for a limited halt to the bombing of North Vietnam, called for new initiatives for a negotiated ceasefire, and told the nation he would not seek re-election for the presidency. The Vietnam War is sometimes referred to as the Helicopter War. Thousands of choppers were used to rapidly transport personnel throughout the war zone to resupply and reinforce troops, and also to evacuate the wounded. With Vietnam's dense jungle terrain, choppers and other aircraft were also used to drop chemical defoliants to eliminate forest cover for enemy troops, as well as crops that might be used to feed them. One of the most commonly used herbicides was called Agent Orange. From 1961 to 1972, more than 19 million gallons of herbicides were dropped on Vietnam, 
These herbicides were highly toxic and have been linked to causing sterility, birth defects, nervous system disorders, tumors, and the development of certain cancers. Soldiers were individually rotated in and out of Vietnam rather than rotating in and out as an entire unit, and their tour of duty lasted one year. As seen in this photograph, this short-timer had one month left in his tour in Vietnam. The challenging terrain could be physically exhausting as soldiers worked their way through thick jungles, sharp vines and foliage, swamps and flooded rice paddies. The monsoon season made for months of continuous hot, humid, rainy fighting conditions. Temperatures sometimes climbed to 120 degrees. Soldiers dealt with leeches, heat exhaustion, malaria, and immersion foot, a painful injury that resulted from days spent traveling in wet combat boots. Many soldiers at the start of the war were volunteers, but as the need for more military forces grew, the draft was instituted. As the war went on and America's involvement escalated, the numbers of drafted soldiers steadily increased. In February 1968, the highest draft call of the war to that date was issued. U.S. soldiers fighting in Vietnam battled with North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces. The Viet Cong were extremely adept at using guerrilla warfare, which means to fight using unconventional means. They relied on use of the environment to help them fight what some called an invisible war. Viet Cong soldiers were skilled at hiding in the jungle, using hit-and-run tactics, and fighting their enemy without being seen. They used hidden weapons, especially landmines and tripwires on land and underwater. Landmines and tripwires were placed where U.S. soldiers were likely to walk. Some were designed to injure and others to kill. The most common tripwires caused grenades to release and explode when soldiers tripped the wire. Two common landmines were the Bouncing Betty and the Toe Popper. With the Bouncing Betty, when soldiers stepped on the hidden device, it would arm, and when they released pressure on the device by removing their foot, it would send explosives into the air. With the toe popper, a shell was buried in the ground with just the tip protruding. The shell sat on a nail or firing pin, and when stepped on, the shell would shoot into the soldier's foot. Thousands of soldiers were killed from stepping on hidden landmines. The Viet Cong also used a variety of booby traps, one of which was the use of punji sticks. These were spikes made out of wood or bamboo, and they were placed upright in the ground in a hole covered by leaves or other foliage. When the soldier stepped into the hole, the sticks impaled his body. Sometimes, the sticks were laced with poison. Additionally, enemy soldiers used elaborate hidden tunnel systems, many underneath villages, that allowed them to move safely underground from one location to another. The tunnels allowed them to easily infiltrate many villages so that U.S. forces often had trouble discerning who was friend or foe. Through the use of tunnels, they could plan surprise attacks, pop up from the tunnels to ambush American soldiers, and then return underground. Soldiers who were sent underground to perform search and destroy missions in the tunnels were often called tunnel rats. Another reality of the Vietnam War was that some military personnel were captured by the enemy and became prisoners of war. Many POWs were pilots who had been shot down over North Vietnam or Laos. The majority of American POWs were held captive longer than in any other war engaged in by Americans. POWs suffered from malnutrition and disease, many were tortured, and some were placed in solitary confinement for years. One of the most famous POWs is John McCain, a naval aviator who was shot down in 1967 over North Vietnam's capital, Hanoi. He would go on to become a U.S. Senator in 1986, and he ran for president in 2008. The anti-war movement began in the 1960s with groups like Students for a Democratic Society and political movements like that of the New Left, who based their anti-war protests on the draft. In January 1965, 5,400 young men were called for the draft. By December of that year, more than 45,000 young men were called. As monthly draft calls increased, the anti-war movement grew. There were legal ways to avoid or delay military service, these included things like physical problems, family hardship, being enrolled full-time in college and pursuing a degree, working in an industry vital to the war effort, or qualifying as a conscientious objector. A conscientious objector is an individual who has claimed the right to refuse to perform military service on the grounds of freedom of thought, conscience, disability, and or religion. As the anti-war movement grew, it led to greater scrutiny of the draft process. Disproportionately, more men from poor and working-class families as well as African-American young men were being drafted over others. 
Those who were drafted but refused military service could face fines and imprisonment, and some chose to flee the country, heading for places like Canada. Prominent civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke out against the war. In a speech given in 1967, he called for an end to the war in Vietnam and said, If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. After President Johnson declined to seek re-election for the presidency, the 1968 presidential election resulted in Richard Nixon taking the White House. Over 530,000 U.S. military forces were serving in Vietnam. During his campaign, Nixon promised the nation to bring peace with honor in Vietnam and stated that he had a secret plan to bring an end to the war in Vietnam. In January 1969, peace talks began, but the war would drag on for four more years. In March 1969, the Nixon administration began a 14-month-long bombing campaign aimed at communist forces using Cambodia as a sanctuary for raids into South Vietnam. When repeatedly questioned by the press if the bombings were taking place, he denied them. The bombings would become public in 1970 and called into question a credibility gap for Nixon. In November, Nixon announced his Vietnamization strategy, which was a policy designed to make the South Vietnamese take more responsibility for fighting the war and enable the U.S. to gradually withdraw its combat troops from Vietnam. Nixon also established a draft lottery system that attempted to eliminate some of the inequities of the previous system. The first draft lottery of the Vietnam War was held on December 1, 1969, and two separate lotteries were held on this date. The first draft lottery assigned numbers to birth dates, and each day of the year was printed on a slip of paper. Each slip was placed in a capsule, and then all the capsules were put into a large container. Announced live on television and radio, capsules were drawn one by one, and the first date drawn was assigned draft number one. Then the second number drawn received draft number two, and so forth until all the dates had been pulled and assigned a draft number. Draftees would be called for duty in order of their draft number, starting with number one, until the military's manpower needs were met. The draft would continue throughout the war until Nixon did away with the draft altogether in 1973, creating an all-volunteer military. In October 1969, the first National Vietnam Moratorium Day, calling for an end to the Vietnam War, was observed across the United States and by people around the world. In November, over 500,000 demonstrators gathered in Washington, D.C. for a moratorium march and rally against the war. Also in November, the My Lai Massacre was first reported by the American press. The massacre took place in March 1968 in the village of My Lai, South Vietnam. Hundreds of unarmed civilians, including women, children, and infants, were killed when 2nd Lieutenant William Calley ordered his soldiers to open fire on the villagers. An American helicopter crew, led by pilot Hugh Thompson Jr., intervened in the massacre by going against orders, flying in between the firing soldiers and civilians and rescuing many villagers and taking them to safety. When details about the massacre reached the American public, it added fuel to the anti-war movement. When details about attempts to cover up the My Lai atrocities were revealed, it called into question the Nixon administration's credibility again, causing many Americans to ask what was really going on in Vietnam. At the end of April 1970, Nixon announced to the nation a ground invasion into Cambodia to attack North Vietnamese military bases. Nixon said he was expanding the war to help end the war, but skeptics continued to question his credibility. Protests over the war's expansion rose up across the country, including at Kent State University in Ohio. At the protest, National Guardsmen opened fire on rock-throwing demonstrators, killing four student bystanders and injuring nine. Vietnam Veterans Against the War formed in 1967 to organize and voice growing opposition to the war among returning servicemen and women. In April 1971, during a week of protest events, thousands of VVAW members marched on Washington, D.C., some even throwing their war medals onto the steps of the Capitol building, calling them medals for murder. At the end of March 1972, the North Vietnamese Army began an invasion of the South. Nixon responded with a bombing campaign called Operation Linebacker. It lasted five months. In October, Nixon's national security adviser, Henry Kissinger, after conducting secret talks with the North, announced that peace is at hand. In December, the peace talks in Paris broke off, and Nixon launched Operation Linebacker II. It was the most intensive bombing campaign of the war. By the end of December, the bombings were stopped and peace talks resumed. 
On January 27, 1973, the Paris Peace Accords were signed. This was an agreement on ending the war and restoring peace in Vietnam. The agreement included an in-place ceasefire where North and South Vietnamese forces would each hold their locations. This meant that over 100,000 North Vietnamese forces in the South did not have to relocate back to the North. This agreement also called for the South Vietnamese to decide its political future and eventual reunification of the country through peaceful means. The South Vietnamese were not allowed to participate in the negotiations, but accepted the agreement on the basis of Nixon's promise of military aid and assurances that the U.S. would respond with force to any violations of the agreement by the communists. In February, 591 American prisoners of war were released, and in the following month, the last U.S. troops and advisors withdrew from Vietnam. By the time U.S. troops had completely withdrawn, the ceasefire had already collapsed, and the war between North and South resumed. Nixon's promise to respond with force against the North was not to be realized. In the summer of 1973, Congress, weary of the war and still angry over Nixon's expansion of the war into Cambodia, passed an amendment to prohibit further U.S. military action in Indochina without congressional approval. Nixon did not have the political support to go against them. The U.S. would continue to provide military equipment, training, and economic support to the South Vietnamese government, but support would decline over the next two years. In 1975, the North launched a full-scale invasion of the South. By the end of March 1975, Northern forces were on their way to the South's capital of Saigon. As Northern forces headed to Saigon in April 1975, the U.S., under the direction of President Gerald Ford, began a series of operations to evacuate American civilians and Vietnamese whose lives would be in danger when the North took over. Over 50,000 were evacuated by commercial airlines and military planes. Tens of thousands of Vietnamese evacuated themselves by cramming into vessels and fleeing to ships waiting offshore. The final phase was called Operation Frequent Wind, the largest helicopter evacuation in history, which resulted in over 7,000 people being evacuated throughout Saigon in just 19 hours. South Vietnamese helicopters assisted as well, and when ships' decks became too clogged for other choppers to land, some of their helicopters were pushed overboard to allow others to land. Others were told to drop off their passengers, take off and ditch their choppers in the sea where they would be rescued. On April 30th, just hours after the last helicopter left the American embassy in Saigon, North Vietnamese tanks crashed through the gates of the presidential palace and put up their flag. The South had fallen to the North, and the Vietnam War was over. The communists renamed Saigon Ho Chi Minh City in honor of their former leader who had died in 1969. In May 1975, Congress authorized over $400 million to help 130,000 refugees from Indochina who had been evacuated during Operation Frequent Wind to settle in the United States. With South Vietnam's fall to the north in 1975, the country of Vietnam became one unified communist nation. In late 1975, Laos Communist Party, supported by the North Vietnamese, took control of the country. Cambodia was seized by the communists, called the Khmer Rouge, and this led to one of the most deadly genocides in history, resulting in the deaths of two million Cambodians. Over 58,000 Americans lost their lives in the Vietnam War or remain missing in action, and an estimated 300,000 were wounded. In 1995, Vietnam released official statements that over two million of its civilians were killed on both sides, and over one million North Vietnamese and Viet Cong fighters were killed. The U.S. military estimates the South Vietnamese forces suffered casualties of 250,000. America's servicemen and women returning from Vietnam came back to an America torn apart by the Vietnam War. Few soldiers were the recipients of welcome home rallies or parades. With the credibility gap issues throughout the war and revelations of American atrocities like those at My Lai, some reacted to returning soldiers with anger and distrust. In some extreme instances, anti-war protesters spit on returning veterans and called them baby killers. More typically, Vietnam veterans returned home to find that people seemed uncomfortable around them and had little inclination to hear about their experiences in the war. Former commander of U.S. military forces in Vietnam, William Westmoreland, argued that returning veterans did not get the recognition or credit they deserved. Monetarily, the prolonged war cost American taxpayers $150 billion. 
Vietnam was left to deal with the aftereffects of a war fought across its land for decades. Large parts of the Vietnamese countryside were scarred by bombs and defoliation. Many cities and towns across the country were heavily damaged, and Vietnamese citizens had to deal with dangerous landmines that remained buried after the war. America's longest and most controversial war left a legacy that many consider a bitter one. Did the United States lose the war? Some avoid the label of winning or losing by arguing the Vietnam War was the least successful war in American history. Whether America won or lost, this question is still debated 40 years after the end of the war. Looking back, President Johnson once said, Our purpose in Vietnam is to prevent the success of aggression. It is not conquest. It is not empire. It is not foreign bases. It is not domination. It is, simply put, just to prevent the forceful conquest of South Vietnam by North Vietnam. In this aspect, the U.S. was not successful. For an alternate view, William Westmoreland once stated, Militarily, we succeeded in Vietnam. We won every engagement we were involved in out there. Additionally, President Nixon claimed he achieved his campaign promise of ending the war with peace and honor because America's troops were brought home and the United States had 591 POWs returned. One lingering effect of the war is often called Vietnam Syndrome. Simply put, this term refers to Americans who have an aversion to getting involved in foreign entanglements. The outcome of the Vietnam War created for some a bias against any type of American military conflict. Those who hold this belief argue that the bad memories of the war have caused Americans to distrust any type of war at all, and that any military conflict the United States engages in will be viewed by the public as another Vietnam. In addition, the issues with the credibility gap with various presidents throughout the war has left a legacy of skepticism and mistrust of those in power. One way America began to heal the wounds caused by the Vietnam War was to honor the veterans who fought in the war. A national memorial was built in Washington, D.C. to honor those who served and sacrificed their lives in the Vietnam War. The memorial was dedicated on November 13, 1982. Inscribed on the black granite walls are the names of more than 58,000 men and women who gave their lives or remain missing in action. The memorial site also features two sculptures, the Three Servicemen and the Vietnam Women's Memorial. In 1990, Congress passed a law recognizing the POW MIA flag, which was first designed in 1972 to honor POWs and soldiers missing in action in Vietnam. It has since become a symbol for POWs and MIAs from all American wars. Another legacy of the Vietnam War includes citizens' efforts to be more assertive in their support of military personnel during recent wars, support of troops that is often independent of how individuals might feel about leaders in Congress or the White House and their approach to foreign policy. As the founders of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial State, it's about honoring the warrior and not the war.